Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Sean Doyle, who is in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> How are you doing, Sean? Very good, very good. Good to be here, John. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. And Sean is a principal at Fitz, Fitzmartin. He's our leading mind and voice on sales and marketing strategy. He's an author, speaker. Um, his first book was published in 2018, Shift 19 Practical Business Driven Ideas for an Executive in Charge of Marketing, but Not Trained for the Task. Excellent, excellent book. And what we're going to talk about today is closing more late stage deals. Uh, we're coming up to the end of the, can you believe it? We're already coming up to the end of the first quarter of, of 2021 for those of you who, who run on uh, calendar, calendar financial years, um, which is quite amazing in itself that we're already that far into 2021. But I'm sure a lot of you are out there now desperately trying to get deals closed and, and get them in before the end of the month, the end of the quarter, et cetera. So, Sean, let's dive straight into it. What are some of the what are some of the things that stall late stage opportunities? Mm. Well, what, first I'll say uh, the data we're seeing and our clients a lot of deal flows happening. So there's been mm. a I think an enthusiasm in this quarter that has been uh, not seen in uh, many many quarters now. <laughs> so I'm encouraged by that, but that's a fairly emotional comment. There's data, there is a, a number of deals. Um, so what is interesting to me about your question is it ties really nicely into the way we think. Um, most marketing firms uh, think from a, let's create awareness. Let's mm -hmm. then get somebody in the pipeline. We're gonna nurture them and kind of help people move forward. When we go in on an engagement, we almost always, we call it selling backward. So we almost always look first at all the deals that you've got that are sitting out there that you haven't closed. And then we say, how do we close those? Then we work backward. The very last thing we wanna do is create more awareness. But that's a, that's a, so it's a good question. Um, the, the cognitive marketing model, which is our scientific model based on the trans theoretical theorem of behavioral change by Nor Norcross, De Clemente and Pertuchka states that there's nine different ways that people can move forward at that late stage, what we would call action. Mm -hmm. uh, there are um, six different things you can do. And I wanna share uh, two things. One, uh, helping relationships. So a helping relationship is a great way to close a deal. It, and it's a common way uh, to, to fix a, a problem of, of deals that don't close. And that's because B2B, you've got multiple decision makers, yep. big CapEx, mm -hmm. and, and you've got to talk to all of them. So what if, and we, and we do this, we help people with late stage sales support, marketing that's designed for the deal. How, when was the last time you saw marketing that was designed for deals, not companies, deals? So you've got company A trying to sell to company B. Why not build a website, a web page? Why not do advertising and deliver it to just those people? Why not record videos that help people understand what it is that this decision is going to look like? You know, mm -hmm. what's, what, what's John, the last time you made a big decision, did you ever think like, what's life going to look like if I pull the trigger? Because yeah, I got I to gotta fire somebody, right? Or mm -hmm. change, I got to change my behavior. I got to change my internal systems. And then there's this unknown and everybody usually can sell a pretty good deal. You know, we all look pretty good when we're selling. We've got our hair. Well, if we have hair, <laughs> then we have our hair nice, like your hair would look great. Yeah, great. You know, it's kind of like going <laughs> on a date, right? I mean, everybody looks good on a date, right? Uh -huh. It's later that we worry about what's this going to look like a year from now. Mm -hmm. So that's the same thing. So help. I mean, help. Can you help people be comfortable, understand, cast a vision of a new, a new way to, of looking and doing things? Yeah, because it's interesting that you say that, John, because I do think there's a couple of things in there that I just wanted to come back on. Um, number one is I think uh, I think sometimes late stage opportunities flounder exactly because of what you said about that there's multiple people involved in the purchasing decision. 
And maybe you haven't done a great job in identifying all of them, in making sure that whoever you are working with has the necessary permissions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen we've seen deals um, often, as I'm sure you have in the past, where everything is everything is done and dusted, and it just requires a signature. <laughs> and then suddenly you're going, well, where's the signature? And they're saying, oh well the CEO is involved now or the CFO is involved now or whatever. Right. And, and you're, and you're left floundering because you, because right. you hadn't realized that they were going to be involved in this process at all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it's fabulous. We, um, on, on a particular, uh, I guess it was last year or early last year, we actually went to sales and said, you know what? I don't think you, Mr. Salesperson have ever really worked with marketing. We didn't use these words, mm -hmm. but, I don't think you've ever worked with marketing that understood sales and saw marketing as a way to help sales, uh, you know, that sales exists or marketing exists to help sales. And that's my belief. So we went to this salesperson and said, why don't you help me understand this deal that you've, you've been working on this, this prospect for years, years, and you haven't closed them. They know you, you know them. Mm -hmm. Like, what are the needs of all the different buyer types? And what are the current, what are the pains? What is the current vendor messing up on? So once we identify needs, some are financial, some are strategic, some are personal, and then we look at the pains of the current vendor, we were able to create a website for that deal. And he could then point people to it. He could use email, he could take a telephone call and point people to this deal. So it was very measurable, right? We know how many people. So we built a web page and it was success that it was seen 40 times, 40 wow. times. Like yeah, that's yeah. crazy, right? Building a website to be seen 40 times. No, it's not crazy. It was a 200 million lifetime, $200 million lifetime value client. They, their first right. order was $500,000. It's an amazing mm -hmm. deal. So it's support. That was all sales support. There was nothing there, but it allowed everybody on the team there was nothing that the salesperson didn't know. It was just nobody from marketing had ever gone and said, can I, how can I support you? How can we use your CRM to uh, send specific messages based on needs? And we did it. And again, I helped close the deal. We didn't close the deal. Marketing doesn't close deals, John. Mm -hmm. Marketing still ports, you know, sales gets attribution. Yeah. And it's interesting what you, what you said there, um, Sean, because I do think this is another thing that, uh, says people and marketing need to pay attention to and that is hyper personalization and I think that's yeah. what now is if you do want if you do want to have a smoother close to your business then you need to do exactly what Sean was just saying there is you need to get hyper personalized in your in your communication and the value you're creating not just for the main contact but for the other folks who are involved in the opportunity as well. So that's why it's imperative that you find out what the drivers are for everyone. Absolutely. You know, John, I think I'd say marketing has this massive talent problem. And mm -hmm. what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is in today's world, in the United States at least, um, you can um, go to two or three companies. Uh, I can name two right now, each of which have 60 thousand craft people, web developers, writers, photographers, videographers, email specialists, database specialists, measurement specialists, strat strategists, I can't, I'm just making up words, yeah, 60,000 people available to them, to you. They're available to me. I can be a member. I'm a member of one of these things. I can bring in a research and insights person drop of a hat. Well, those 60,000 people are available to John Golden, to Sean Doyle, to Fitzmartin, to every company. So if, if talent is ubiquitous, I can get talent from anywhere in the country on one website in a heartbeat. Well, then what's the difference? How, how can we produce, how can marketing produce results? You got to have a point of view and you've got to mm -hmm. understand sales and you've got to have, our belief is you have to have science that backs up what it is you're supposed to do. Otherwise, marketers tend to keep creating awareness and awareness mm -hmm. doesn't close deals, right? No. Answering pain points closes deals. Helping people look forward before, before you decided to get in shape. And that time, remember that time that you decided to get in shape and you really did? 
Well, one thing you did is you looked forward at what would life look like after this change? It wasn't that you needed more awareness that gyms existed or that diet might help. You had to have a way to look into the future and see what my life might look like if I lost the weight and got in shape. That's exactly what late stage sales should look like. Mm -hmm. And the CFO cares about one thing, the CEO cares about something else, the operations guy cares about something, marketing cares about, I mean, everybody has a very specific set of needs. Yeah. Technology is there, you just gotta do it. And I, and I think the other thing you're touching upon here is this idea, uh, idea and I think that sometimes it's overlooked and that is which is called deal emotion. And the fact is that there, it's operating on multiple levels, right? So you've got the people you're dealing with, the prospects, and maybe multiple people within that organization. You know, they all are invested in this project or maybe even against it for varying different reasons. And you need to figure out, but you need to figure out not just the, not just the company motivations, but the personal motivations. And sometimes those personal motivations have actually have really nothing to do with the business driver and everything to do with the individual. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, there's some science out of UCAL Berkeley that we love and it supports pain points and says there's strategic pain points, financial pain points and personal pain points. Mm -hmm. And everybody, when I'm teaching or talking, everybody says, well, what's a personal pain point? Uh, I wanted to be vice president. That's a personal pain point. So mm -hmm. if I buy your product or service, will it elevate me in the organization? That's what I want to know, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what's that have to do? Is that wrong to sell to that? No, no, no it's not wrong. No. It's smart to sell to that. Yeah. And, Unless and by you're the lying. Way, <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, Sean, I, I would, um, this is unscientific, but this is just my gut feel over many years, is that a lot of the times pe you lose out to no decision it's because of the, the, what you just said there, like maybe wants to become VP, or maybe she is worried that if she brings this in and it doesn't go well, it's going oh. to inhibit her, inhibit her or his path forward. So, and I think that's what happens a lot with no decisions is when people just go, I'm just gonna err on the side of safety here. So a lot of what you have to do is really like help persuade people that they're making the right decision and that you're going to be with them. Absolutely. The way. And I know we touched on it in a previous conversation, mm -hmm. how an often a, a big mistake, marketers make this mistake more than salespeople. It's going to close the deal way too fast. Yep. Um, and in, even the behavioral science, cognitive marketing science says that the first step is to make a private commitment. The second step is to make a public commitment. So let's go back to that time you lost the weight and you got in shape and now you're the handsome guy that you are today. So you were looking at this and you might've had an appointment with a trainer. You might've looked on some websites because you can do that privately, at least you used to be able to, right? That's a whole another conversation, online mm -hmm. privacy. But um, yeah. you, know, you explored what it would look like. You looked at your calendar, you looked at your checkbook. Can I afford to buy better food and to get a gym membership. You made all those personal commitments before you said to your significant other, this is what I'm gonna do, or your friends or your social circle, why? Well, because you didn't wanna be embarrassed a month later. You know, you didn't wanna just yeah. go, hey, I'm gonna go do this. And then a month later, people are saying, John, mm -hmm. nothing's changed, what's happened? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing, I didn't do it. <laughs> I just thought, you know, well, okay. So escalate that to a corporate setting there's no way I'm going to risk saying, well, I'm going to bring in XYZ company to do this until I know there's safety. I need to mm -hmm. know exactly what you're going to say. So the first close should happen, late stage sales, but the first close is a one-to-one. -one, and then you bring in all those other decision makers and make a public commitment because that is a public commitment. Mm -hmm. When I say yeah. to the other executives or people above me in the, in the org chart, when I say I'm looking at bringing in something, for changing something, I personally am at risk, right? Wow, you've got to solve that. So that's another massive. So we've identified two great ways to close more late stage deals here, John. Yeah. And I do, and I do think people overlook that one a lot in terms of I think they take it for granted sometimes. Uh, instead of actually proactively saying, you know, Sean, I just want to walk you through what happens. Um, you know, once you become a customer, you know, especially in the implementation and the onboarding stages and all of that, I'm going to be there with you. Here's how it's going to work. You're not going to be on your own because 
for me, that is the biggest thing that people have bad experiences of, regardless of whether what kind of purchase. It's that time when yeah. they bought something from a great salesperson who, who they thought was a great salesperson. And the first time they hit a speed bump, that person wasn't interested in talking to them either, like right, showed them off right. to support or whatever, and then just complete. Yep. And so that that is often overlooked, but it's so critical. We're seeing incredible amount of growth in our business, helping people set up and structure customer success programs. There's technology mm -hmm. to support that. Um, and there's people to structure in that structure to support that. But the thing is then that that's a marketing tool, a sales tool to close more deals too. You know, we're going to hand you off to this person. You know, think about it, you go in for surgery, right? The, yeah. the, the nurse says, we're going to hand you off to the doctor. The doctor, she says, you're going to hand off to the post office. The post office says, we're going to hand you. I mean, you know the whole journey before you go. And we don't, for some reason in business, we just forget that that's important. Right. Yeah. And it's OK. Salespeople, you don't have to be the customer success person. In fact, you shouldn't be. Customer success should be designed differently than the way sales is designed. The horrible use of a salesperson to have them doing customer maintenance, mm -hmm. solving problems. Now, now it's great. I, I want sales to go kind of check in once in a while and cross sell. Yeah. That's great. But don't solve problems. Don't solve technical problems or delivery problems. Or that's the wrong use of sales. Yeah. So yeah, great observation, John. Yeah, yeah. So um, so make sure the the handoffs are elegant, and as you said, make sure that you're you're available to triage if you need to at any stage. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You can. Here's my phone number. You can always call me. Um, but now Joe Smith or Sally Jones mm -hmm. is going to be in charge of you. And they're going to be your customer relationship person. And that's mm -hmm. incredible. That's where you know, CRM, again, supports uh, that idea of what is the data, what's the business intelligence that technology can bring you. Um, and uh, you know, service delivery, too. I, I think marketing should come in. One of the promises of consultancy, sales and marketing consultancy like ours make is we can actually reduce budgets. And everybody goes, well, well what? I thought y'all made ads. No. We can make an ad, but that's very secondary. But one way we can reduce budget is we, we just did a program for a company where we um, did very, very simple um, YouTube kind of video styles shot with an iPhone level, very low quality, inexpensive of how to fix a manufactured item. And there's a piece of this manufactured item that just has standard maintenance shot a four minute video, put it on a website, took what used to be a one hour telephone call and or a service call that could have, I mean, six, seven, eight thousand dollars to go out in the field, fly, drive, rent trucks, hotel rooms, time out of the office, reduced it to a four minute video and took that time. And that's all now refocused internally. So we're saving this company tens of thousands of dollars a week because marketing provided support to customer success. And this is something that can be self done. If you can't figure it out, if you can't figure out how to replace that, that part with a screwdriver and, a, and an iPhone, then we'll be there tomorrow. Yeah. But you know, I mean, marketing can have so much impact late yeah, stage. Absolutely. And I think also then, that, like you said, with customer success is that whole uh, internal marketing piece, because the other thing is, which I think is overlooked hugely by a lot of organizations is that when you do sell something in you into a company and whoever the people are in that company who are in charge of that project is giving them the tools to market it within their own organization. That's Absolutely. where, and, and people often overlook, they say, well, what, what, is, what do you mean by internal marketing? And I'm saying you're using the, you're, you're not using, you're helping the people there yeah actually promote the solution within their company. Great, we're helping a client through a, a joint venture right now and both organizations have sales forces. So mm -hmm. one thing we're gonna do, I don't know if you've heard of this thing called podcasting, John, but I think it's Never gonna be big. It. No, mm -hmm. you should yeah. check into it, really. Yeah. No, it's uh, an, incredible, uh, an incredible use of podcasting. We're gonna get the two SVPs of sales together, record it, just like we're doing right now. We're mm -hmm. gonna basically create an internal podcast. Both sales forces will hear, learn, get ideas, see how they can make money, understand what the other company does in this joint venture. It's going to be fabulous. So again, it's great. I, internal marketing is, internal communications is critical, no doubt. 
-hmm. Yeah, and I can live yeah. anymore. It's almost, uh, you know, you internet, if you don't have an internet, just throw up a web page. Just don't yep. put it in your navigation and you're done. You know, yeah, great. yeah, no, it, it, it's it, it's very simple. I mean, to be honest, uh, Sean, as, as you well know, I mean, the, the tools are so simple, they're so easy to access, um, that really there's no excuse for it. And plus something you touched on earlier, by the way, if you say, well, that's all very well for you, John, because you have a massive <laughs> team behind you or whatever, you go, yeah, um, you go, actually, Today, with with uh, contract uh, work and all of that, I mean, you can find uh, experts to help you do everything. So you don't have to always go down this path of thinking that you have to hire somebody because there's a lot of very specialized uh, yep. uh, specialized tasks that need to be done nowadays. So fractional resources or variable resources or using contractors, there's no excuse for you not yep. to be able to do things cost effectively. But what we I'll add to that. I'm not going to say you're wrong, but I'm going to say. It was insufficient. And here's what's missing. Um, you've got to have a point of view. We mentioned that earlier. Yeah. I mentioned marketing yeah. as a talent problem. It's not that people don't know how to write and design and dev and mm -hmm. all this stuff, but people, if they don't understand you and your point of view, then they're just off doing whatever their belief system is. So here's what we do, because we do use fractional resources. I used to have probably 20 more employees than I do now on mm -hmm. my team. I don't have to have them now and everybody is happier about it. My clients are happier because I don't have to charge an annualized rate for some really expensive person. They're happier, the, the, the fractional employee, because they get to work for me. I do all the hard work and they get paid and they know it's work and they just, I just bring them work, right? But here's the deal. I've got a website set up. They have to understand the cognitive marketing model because if they don't, they can't come in to my office, work with my team, work with me, and my best clients learn my model. And they say, so I can say, John, we've got what we've been talking about today. If we were at the office, we'd call a four or five conversion. That means we're taking people from stage four that are at the mm -hmm. action point to stage five, which is an exchange relationship. So around here, I'd say, I was talking to my client, John Golden today. He's got a four or five conversion problem. We need to work on that. Now, my team immediately knows there's six processes that can be used here and how to use them. And they know not to do all that awareness stuff and all that early stage stuff. And they know exactly what your problem is. So I do require my fractional resources to be just as understanding as my full-time mm -hmm. people. And you've got to do that. I think you've got to have a point of view. You have to have a belief system. Otherwise you get fragmented marketing you know, either the last thing they read in Harvard Business Review or Communication Arts or just whatever, that's what you're going to get back. And yeah, that's yeah. inadequate. That's inadequate leadership. That's on that's on leadership to establish what what the system is going to be. But again, how easy is it to record videos? I'm actually doing in three weeks, I'm going to record a new set because I've learned, I've continued to learn uh, within <clears throat> the application of this trans theoretical model to sales mm -hmm. and marketing. So I'm gonna update my videos. They're on the website. I'm gonna ask all my fractional and full-time people to watch them again. You know, gosh, isn't that miserable? I'm making people watch videos yeah, yeah. of me, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, but you know, um, it's, it's a good point uh, because yeah, it, it's great to be able to use them, but you need to have them all aligned properly and, and running to them, you know, with your mm -hmm. philosophy and your point of view. And I think that's a great place. Uh, it's a great place to end today, um, Sean, but I think that's a really un important point to underline is what Sean said about having a point of view. Mm -hmm. um, you need to, it's, it's the only way you're really going to differentiate yourself today is, you know, how you approach selling your point, your point of view, it's, you know, give people the feeling that there's something a little bit different about you. Not so different that scares them off, but a little right. bit different. Right. I was, you know, I had a conversation with my daughter and son-in-law the other day about their bosses. And, and one of them has a boss that um, is making bad decisions. And the other has a boss that won't make decisions. And mm. my, and I, I kept saying, the boss who's making the wrong decision is actually the better boss mm -hmm. than the boss who won't make a decision. And that's the same thing here. You're better off to have a point of view, teach it yeah. and learn and adjust than to yeah. just think this marketing thing is not this big mushy deal that's all emotional. Yeah, There's no, science I, behind it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think as, as long as that boss isn't making the same bad decision every day, 
no think doubt. it's progress. <laughs> no doubt. That's, no, uh, it's absolutely. It's, it remains it's absolute. to be uh, seen. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. And, and, but, and you're in the business of systems, right? You're in the business mm-hmm. of creating sure. technology tools that support consistent decision making, consistent learning, and yeah. adjustments. And, and if you have marketing technology, then you can do that. If you don't, if you're a Luddite and have avoided all this technology, mm-hmm. it's time to dive in. If you don't yeah. think about your technology as a tool upon which you can make further decisions, if you're making decisions without looking at the data, then that's on you because the, the data is available now. Yeah, yeah. No, if you're if you're making decisions without looking at the data, if you're not uh, bringing in and collaborating with your team teammates, if you're not using technology to help you be more focused and more efficient, then uh, well, good luck. That's all I can say. Absolutely. Well, this is why you have one of the best podcasts in the business, John. You uh, you. you have great insights. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, All of Sean's information will be below this video. But before we go, Sean, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Oh, come on. So I work at Fitzmartin. We're a sales and marketing consultancy. You've probably picked up that we're a little different than the average group. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're sales first and we work backward. We work from the latest stage deals back to the uh, wider opportunities that advertising and marketing is known for. So we look forward to uh, hearing from you. Please visit us at fitzmartin.com, F-I-T-Z-M-A-R-T-I-N.com, or just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be glad to share any of this framework uh, and any information. I'm, I've decided I'm old enough. I don't have any real secrets. I'll share anything <laughs> I got. So uh, feel free. Yeah, that's great. Listen, thanks, Sean. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.